the parable that Pastor Enrique read is one that many people know. It's been preached on many times. And even for those who don't go to church regularly, it's made its way into some of the secular culture. The parable of the prodigal son. And on this Father's Day, we're going to revisit that famous parable. It's a story of the prodigal son. It touches the heart. The father is the envy of all of us who claim the name father. He's loving, he's generous, he's forgiving. He is the good, good father that our praise team has sung about. It is the one story in the New Testament that illustrates the depth of God's love. I had a friend of mine who, every time we would read this story, got angry. And she said, I hate that story. And I said, how can you hate that story? And she said, because I feel like the older brother. If you were to continue on in the story, past what we read, there is a section of the older brother who had been faithful and stayed with the father, tending the fields and the livestock, doing everything that a good son would do. And when he sees his father throw this reckless love at his wayward brother, he doesn't even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours. <laughs> he gets upset. How come you've never done that for me? You've never given me a ring or a robe. You've never thrown a feast in my honor. That's why, that's why when a sermon about the prodigal father is given and someone talks about his reckless love, they get mad because the father shouldn't have done that because they're like the older brother. The term prodigal is associated over time with the son in this story, but that word could easily be applied to the father. The definition of prodigal is someone who spends money or resources freely and recklessly. Or you might say he is wastefully extravagant. It's easy to see how this applies to the son. He took everything he was given and he threw it away. He squandered every cent on his own pleasure without a thought for the future. It was a waste. What's worse is the fact that it was an affront to the father. He was in essence saying, I wish you were dead because I want what will be mine now. It really was a heartless, cruel thing that he was asking. And he gave no thought to the father's feelings. He was just thinking about himself. Of course, that's the way that sin works. It's not just about breaking a few rules. It's the rejection of of the most significant relationship that you can have. You see, this son didn't care that in making this demand, he was breaking his father's heart. You see, the son was saying, I don't care what plans you have for me. I just want to do what I want to do. It's my life. Why can't I go out and live it now? Why do I have to wait until tomorrow? When you think about it that way, it's easy to understand why Jesus told this parable. That's exactly what so many of us have done, maybe not to the same extreme. We've told God that we want to be the king of our castle. We want to be in control of our lives. We don't want anyone telling us what to do. It's everywhere you look, from love is love, to don't touch my guns, to is my body my choice, to I have a right to, and you just name it. How many times have we rejected God by saying with our choices, leave us alone and let us live life the way we want to live it. You're not in charge of me. But here's the amazing part about this story. When the father heard what the son was asking, he gives him his freedom and lets him go. He knew that love can only possess what it releases. He loved his son too much to restrain him. Theologically speaking, we call this free will, this gift that God gives us. We can choose to live how we want to live. God gives us that freedom. 
in the hope that one day we'll come to our senses and choose to come back to him, to love and to honor him. I've often heard it said that, that, you know, why does God do that? Why can't we all just be created in such a way that from the time we're born, we just love him and honor him? As if that's the default switch and we don't ever have an option to do otherwise. You know, if I was God, that's what I'd do. But then again, I'm a father. And I don't want my children just to blindly follow what I say. I want them to grow and experience life, but I want them to do it in God's terms. We set rules. And yet, any parent will tell you that sometimes their heart is broken because their children don't go in the way that you have tried to guide them. I've talked to many parents over the years who who are suffering with heartache because of some of the choices their children have made, and yet they know that they can't force them They just continue to pray that God will in time bring them home, bring them back to their senses. It's not easy to let your children go. But God lets us go, not because he doesn't love us, but because he does. Those of us with children know how hard it is to watch them struggle, and so does God as he watches us. You can only imagine how it feels to God every time we make wrong choices in our lives. In this story, the son makes a deliberate choice. He heads off for the wildlife. For most of us, it is much more subtle. We tend to drift off. First, it's little things, and next thing you know, it's our plans, our money, our deepest relationships. Until finally, and finally, there's no room for God left. Prayer becomes difficult or hardly exists at all. God's guidance for our lives seems irrelevant because God seems so far away. You know, in this story, it talks about the boy going far away, but so often, that's how we are. We drift away from God. And it seems like God has abandoned us. But it's really not God who's moved, but us. You know, we read this story and a lot of times we look at it and we think of this son as having done horrible things. He's gone after drugs, he's been boozing it up, sleeping with prostitutes, living like a pig until he actually lives with the pigs. You know, that makes it easy to disassociate ourselves from him. But all sin is sin to God. We may not go that far, but our sin leaves us feeling desperate and alone. In the process, we become slaves to the new routines in our lives that keep us bound and away from God. My father, my father used to smoke. And I remember as a teenager, I used to tell him, Dad, you got to quit, you got to quit, you got to quit. Dad, you can't stop. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going you're gonna to get sick. You're gonna... and, and I was after him all the time. And he finally quit. And it was great. But when I was 17 and a half, I met a girl and she smoked. And I thought it would be cool to try it. I remember I had a classmate of mine who said, Cal, you're going to get hooked on that. You should stop. And I said, no, nah, not me. <laughs> Guess what? It took me 13 years to quit. That's what sin does in our lives. It starts off small. It's something, and we think we're in control of it, but before long, before long, we become a slave to whatever it is that we've given ourselves to. But here's the good news. We have a Father in heaven who exercises reckless love, outlandish love, extreme love, wasteful and some would say extravagant. The great Scottish preacher John McNeil told that during his childhood he had to walk a long distance from home every night. And his route led through a forest with a large ravine. And reports said that wild animals and gangs of robbers were often seen in that area and great fear would seize him as he made his way home past past that spooky looking tree. He recalled one night it was especially dark but I was aware that something or someone was moving slowly and quietly toward me. And I was sure it was a robber. And when a voice called out, its eerie tone struck my heart with fear. I thought I was finished. But then came a second call. This time I could hear the voice saying, John, is that you? And it was my father. 
He had known my fear, and he had come all the way out to meet me and bring me safely home. It was a word from John McNeil's father that brought peace to his fearful heart that night. And God wants us to know that there is, that he is waiting and watching for us to come home. He's able to expel our fears and eliminate our worries. And he's got this extravagant love that is willing to forgive us for our sin, wherever we've been, whatever we've done. There's a hymn that says it best. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's watching and waiting, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. This is the God we love. This is the God who loves us. No matter where we've been, no matter how far from home we have been, he is watching and waiting for us to turn around, to repent, to come home to him. You know, some people think of God as an angry father who's waiting to catch us in our wrongdoing and punish us. He's watching and waiting for us to step out of line so that he can banish us forever. But Jesus gives us a completely different picture here. He paints God as a loving father who never loses hope that we will come back to him. He lets us go, but then he waits, watching for any sign that we are ready to repent and come home. In our story, the father does something that is so unexpected that others, and particularly the older brother, cannot understand. Rather than lecturing the returning son or rejecting his plea of forgiveness, the father joyfully receives the son without commenting on his sin. And this is a part of the story that I love. In fact, it says, when the son was yet a great way off. Think about that. He was still a long way off. He hadn't had a chance to apologize, to repent uh, in front of his father. He was still far away. It says, the father ran to meet him and kissed him. He didn't even make it to the outer gate because the father came running out to greet him. He saw him from afar. And I think God does that for us when, when our hearts start to turn, when we want to come home, but we're afraid because we say, hey, you don't know what I did. You don't know where I've been. I've made a mess of my life. I'm hitting rock bottom right now. And I don't know what to do, but, but I heard about a God who has a reckless love, an extravagant love, who if I go to him, he'll come. And God meets you more than halfway. Too often, too often when we think about things, we worry about precedent. You hear that a lot, especially in government. What will this say to others in the same situation? We don't want them to think we'll do this for everyone. But that's, as pricely, that's precisely what Jesus wants us to know that God's love and grace extends to all of his children. I was having a conversation with my friend Dan, who's here today, yesterday, and, um, and he was talking about the fact that, that God calls all of us his children. He's called all of us to be a part of his family. That means when God says, love your enemies, God's talking about another one of his children who's just gone wrong, gone bad. Jesus wants us to know that that grace extends to everyone. And if you come to him, he will meet you halfway or more. It's reckless. No one else would do that. But we're not God. By definition, John says in his first letter that God is love. In Christ, we see that God's grace is sufficient to cover all sin. And when you give God an inch, he will give you a mile. If you come a little way to him when you are yet a great way off, he will run to meet you. I don't, know, I don't know what the prodigal saw. I don't know that the prodigal saw his father, but his father saw him. The eyes of mercy are quicker than the eyes of repentance. Even the eyes of our faith is dim compared to the eyes of God's love. Slow are the steps of repentance, but swift are the feet of forgiveness. 
God has a way of seeing men and women, you and I, in ways that we can't understand. He sees right through us at a glance, as if we were made of glass. He sees all of our past, but he also sees our present, and he looks to our future, a redeemed, a restored future in Jesus Christ. What the Father did for the Son, God does for each and every one of us. It says when we met him, it says when he met him, he fell on his neck and kissed him. Now in the Near Eastern culture, it was beneath the dignity. And this is maybe where some people don't like this. It was beneath the dignity of a father to run. You know, fathers, they're like me, tough, macho man. <laughs> But in that culture, fathers didn't run. They were in control. But when it says that the father saw his son from far off, he began to run. It told you something about the nature and the character of God. God doesn't care about stereotypes. God cares about you and me. And he will do anything to bring us home. It says he fell on his neck and kissed him. The fact that God did that in such reckless regard illustrates that the grace of God does not operate as we think it should. You see, that's where the older brother got it all wrong. The older brother was just thinking of himself and how he had, and he forgot that he always, as the father said to him, always had the father with him, always had the blessing. Those of us who have had faith and been in God's love for all of our lives, we have been blessed. We need to be thanking God for the things he's done in our life. And then we need to, unlike that brother, look at those who are still lost and be praying for them that they would know the Father's love and they'd come home. All God wants is for each and every one of us to come home and receive his forgiveness and new life. And when we turn to him, he's at our side before we can even say, I'm sorry. That is the reckless love of God as seen through this story of the prodigal father. May you know that love. If you're feeling far from God, just turn around and wait. And before long, God will come to you, the Father in heaven. Amen. We're going to close our service today by, um, did we, were we able to get the video? Yes. By uh, a video. Actually, I have to, I have to just uh, thank uh, Pastor Enrique. On our Saturday night anchor church, we've been doing the theme of love and uh, on the first Sunday after his teaching, we sang this, uh, I think it was this song, or a version of this song, Reckless Love. If you'll stand with me, and you may not be familiar with it, but if you want to join in where you can, uh, we're going to close with Reckless Love. <laughs> 